Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar. As the title suggests, this webinar is aimed at people who've been diagnosed with celiac disease for over a year at least. It's been produced by dietitians working for Somerset Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. But before we start, I just want to go through some tips and tricks just to help you get the most out of today's session. If you're joining us immediately, having just registered, and you're able to download some of the handouts, we recommend that you do that now. These handouts can be found by clicking on the symbol. And if you're watching on a computer or a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet, you should say a little round icon with a page on it. If you click on that, you'll see four handouts listed and you can download them straight onto your appliance from there. Uh, you won't be able to pause or rewind this webinar. However, if you leave the session, you will receive an email 24 hours later, which will include a recording of this webinar. And from that recording, you will be able to rewind, fast forward, or watch it as many times as you like. Anyway, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Uh, our presenters today are Leah Seamark and Leslie Harper, who are both specialist gastroenterology dietitians, and they're both working on developing dietetic celiac service in Somerset. My name is Marianne Willins, and I'm also a specialist gastroenterology dietitian working alongside Leslie and Leah. I'd also like to take this opportunity just to highlight that we are healthcare professionals and not webinar or IT experts. So please do bear with us if we experience any technical difficulties, although obviously we'll attempt to resolve them as quickly as possible. So without further ado, I will pass over to Leah and Leslie. Thank you. So before we start with the content of today's webinar, just to let you know, we have already produced a webinar aimed at people who have newly been diagnosed with celiac disease. So if you would like to access this, you can email us at patient.webinars at nhs.net for the link. We cover a lot of topics in that webinar. Um, a list of those topics are here. So it includes a bit of background to celiac disease, the diagnostic procedures, and lots of information to help you follow the gluten-free diets. Because we have covered these topics in a previous webinar, we're not going to go into much detail about them today. But if you would like to get more information on them, please do email us for a link for that registration. So the aim of this webinar, it's something that we would recommend people with celiac disease access once a year. And it's really a reminder of things to consider to help you self-manage your condition. We will talk about when, how and who to contact for further support and advice. Running alongside this webinar, we are aiming to produce bite-sized webinars covering some key topics, including how to meet your county requirements, information about oats, but we'll tell you where you can get information about those webinars towards the end of this session. So what will this webinar discuss? So we'll look at height and weight and what you should be keeping an eye on. We'll be looking at symptoms in terms of the range of symptoms you may have presented with, but also looking at how we would expect those symptoms to improve once you start the gluten-free diet, uh, a checklist to ensure adherence to the gluten-free diet, and also information on where to go for further advice. Okay, so looking after your health with celiac disease is not only about the gluten-free diet, but it's important to look at, uh, after other aspects of your health also. So we would encourage you to self-monitor your weight, and we'd like you to note any unexplained weight changes. You can monitor your weight at home, at your local chemist or your GP surgery. Um, and we would anticipate some weight variation. About 5% or less may be normal. And this may be to do with what we've drunk, whether we've opened our bowels or not, hormonal changes and also the time of day. If you do notice any unexplained weight loss, we would really like you to alert your GP to this. It could be that it could be a sign of, of malabsorption or something else which your GP may want to look into in a bit more detail. And if you have experienced unexplained weight loss, then I would suggest looking at the website, the malnutrition self-screening website developed by Bapen. And here you can add details of your weight and your height and past weight, and it will help you to calculate your, your risk of malnutrition. There's also some really useful first line information on this website to help you minimise your weight loss. Additionally, your GP may refer you to a dietitian for more specialist advice. Then 
we look at body mass index. So this is a useful guide. So it's also referred to as BMI, which can help you assess whether you're within a healthy weight range, whether you may be underweight or whether you may be carrying extra weight. If you are gaining weight, then you may wish to use the healthy eating tips or weight loss plans available on the NHS Live Well website. And additionally, if you're looking at being more active in Somerset, you can look at the Zing Somerset website, which is a really useful tool to seek out activities and clubs in your local area. You just put your postcode in to access this. And um, that's really interesting, actually, Leslie, that you say that. Do you find that uh, quite a lot of people complain about gaining weight when they start the gluten-free diet? Yeah, I would say it's something that does crop up quite often, actually. And there's a number of reasons for this. So one of them is that when you start a gluten-free diet, your gut may actually is, is likely to be healing and therefore you're more likely to be absorbing all your nutrients, whereas you may not have been before. So that could be a reason for the for the weight gain. Also, I think sometimes there's a lack of choice when eating out and, and this is getting better, but sometimes you'll go to places and there might just be a gluten free cake available. Additionally, um, there may be perhaps for some people some overcompensation with gluten free treats in the diet. So you might find that you're no longer able to eat foods which you used to really enjoy. And then as you know more about the gluten free diet, you, you find the different brands of cakes and biscuits and things. And perhaps we might be eating more of these foods than what we did before. And that could be another reason for gaining weight. So a lot of people do complain that a lot of the gluten free foods are high in sugar and fat and things as well. So are you saying that sometimes people are just putting too many of those gluten-free alternatives in their diet, whereas before they might have been reaching for something yeah, less calorific? Yeah, I believe calorific? so, yeah. Mo I mean, there was a study, I think, a few years ago that looked at sh um, sugar and fat content of various foods, and I think it found there wasn't actually that much difference, but actually it might be that, yeah, people are overcompensating. Yeah. Thanks. That's great to know. So how strict are you with your gluten-free diet? Well, we've got this self-assessment test, which you can do. Um, it's available on our website, www.patientwebinars.co.uk. And it can help you to self-assess management of your celiac disease. So the questionnaire asks you seven questions. And for each question, you have a score, depending on your answer. You then add up all your seven scores to obtain your final score. Depending on your score, if you score between seven and 12, this suggests that you have good management of your celiac disease. And we would encourage you to continue to access our webinars annually to update your knowledge on the gluten free diet. And information on these webinars can be found on the web page on this slide. If you scored slightly higher between 13 and 17, this suggests that you may benefit from some additional support. And we would encourage you to watch the perhaps watch the newly diagnosed celiac disease webinar that we have on our website. And if after watching this webinar, if you feel that you will benefit from further support, then you can complete our self-referral form. This self-referral form is attached to, as a handout on this webinar and also it's available on our patient webinars website. And you may then be offered an appointment with a specialist community dietitian. Leslie, can I just ask, is that just for Somerset uh, patients? That is just for Somerset patients. So yes. patients who've got a GP in Somerset. So anybody who's watching this nationally yeah. who doesn't live in Somerset won't have access to that self-referral form. Should they contact their local dietetic department uh, in their local area and see yes, if they can get referred I would to them? encourage them to do that. Or yeah. go and see their GP or see and their ask GP. for a referral. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. If you scored at the higher end, so 18 or more, this suggests that you would benefit from some additional support to manage your condition. And we would recommend that you complete our self-referral form as per um, the discussion previously. Would you say watch the first uh, webinar as well, the newly diagnosed one, meanwhile, while you're Yeah, working? certainly. I think that would be a good yeah. idea to watch that in the interim and you, you might yeah. find some helpful advice on that. Because I think also. sometimes in some areas of the UK, um, you might find outside Somerset that it might take a while to get a referral to a dietitian. So at least you know uh, that if you've scored high, you are at least getting some really good accurate information from our newly diagnosed. Yeah, definitely. Webinar. I think that's a really good okay. idea. 
So what about symptoms? So moving on to symptoms, um, just briefly, we're going to talk about some of the symptoms which are associated with celiac disease. So celiac disease is a autoimmune condition which affects the lining of the small intestine. And that reaction is triggered by gluten. So people with celiac disease who eat gluten, that can then cause damage to the lining of the small intestine. Um, the small intestine is where the body absorbs all the nutrients from the foods that we eat. Therefore, it can lead to some gut related symptoms, including indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting, stomach cramps and bloating. And these are some of the symptoms we traditionally associate with celiac disease. However, there are a range of other symptoms that we also see. So that includes osteoporosis, so a weakening of the bones, tooth enamel defects, low vitamin B12 folate levels, anemia due to low iron levels, fatigue, problems that affect growth and puberty, which is especially seen in children and teenagers, skin rash, which is known as dermatitis hepatiformis, which is the skin manifestation of celiac disease, persistent mouth ulcers, abnormal liver functions, and also we have sometimes see fertility problems. Leah, would you expect everyone to present with all of these symptoms? No, not at all. Everyone's absolutely completely different in their presentation. So I've seen people in clinic who just present with the gut related symptoms and none of these other associated symptoms here. I've had patients who actually have no gut symptoms at all and their diagnosis of celiac disease kind of came from the fact that they were anemic. Um, and I don't know about you, Marion and Leslie, I also see I've, patients who yeah. have had none of these symptoms. I mean, you've had a patient recently, haven't you, um, Leslie, who whose sister was diagnosed purely because she'd been diagnosed, but the sister had absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Yeah. And just because she was diagnosed, they thought they'd better test the sister and the sister mm. came back positive. Yeah. So, you know, you, you don't necessarily get any symptoms at all. Okay. I mean, I've also heard a lot about neurological symptoms. Um, what, what's the story about that? Yep, so neurological symptoms are becoming increasingly in the, aware that some people with celiac disease also suffer from neurological symptoms. Um, one of the symptoms often seen is ataxia, so that is caused by damage to the part of the brain which is responsible for sort of coordinated movements and balance. So symptoms of ataxia may be sort of clumsiness, loss of balance, poor coordinated movement which can lead to sort of falls and it can also include slurred speech. Um, peripheral neuropathy, so sort of numbness and tinglings in the hands and feet, and also sort of severe headaches and migraines. And these headaches and migraines are ones that don't go away with the traditional treatments which you may have previously used. Um, and it's interesting that we didn't really know a huge amount about these neurological symptoms sort of 10 years ago, but it's one of Celiac UK's sort of top 10 research priorities at the moment. So it's something we're becoming increasingly aware of. And actually, a um, recent paper showed that actually 61% of people with newly diagnosed celiac disease had neurological symptoms. So is that something that you sometimes see in clinic? Yeah, definitely. I, especially the headaches. I do get a lot of patients who have headaches, but they've never put it together with the celiac disease. And certainly before they were diagnosed, they, they would never have related it to perhaps the gut symptoms they had. So, no, definitely. I see a lot of people and, and often when they go on the gluten free diet really strictly, uh, the headaches clear up. And I've had some patients who actually describe it as almost like a foggy head. Yeah. You know, foggy brain. It mm. seems there's got a bit of a fog over it. Yeah. But there's, yeah, there's that sort of foggy head that's not being able to think clearly. Um, but the headaches seem to be slightly different. You know, it's those really, uh, and they're really regular headaches. They're having them several times a week, probably. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because, yeah, I remember years ago seeing many people who were newly diagnosed and they presented with neurological symptoms and we just didn't associate it mm. at all back then. So obviously things have changed and research mm. has moved on. Mm. Um, Leah, you discussed the range of symptoms associated with celiac disease, but when people with the condition start the gluten-free diet, how long should it take before they start to feel better? Okay, that's a really good question. And that's a question we often get asked when people are first diagnosed, when they come and see us. So the question, the answer to that is, again, is it's very independent. So lots of people do say they start to feel better within a few days of starting the gluten-free diet. Some of the gut symptoms, especially like the nausea, the diarrhea and the bloating can resolve within weeks. But it's important to remember that the gut damage, which can occur, can take up to six months to five years to completely heal. So some people may be still having some symptoms associated with that years after that diagnosis. And again, because of that, some symptoms may actually take several months to completely resolve. And again, some symptoms may get better before others. So I've had patients who say the gut symptoms 
improve quite quickly. However, the sort of feeling of tiredness and fatigue take a lot longer to fully resolve. And I was listening to a, a research uh, research talk about the other day who was saying that often people who are still suffering a bit a year or two years down the line, uh, sometimes they're just getting cross-contamination. They're not even aware they're getting. I mean, I see patients who didn't even realise that cross-contamination was important with celiac disease. So, uh, you know, it needs to be really careful. If you've still got symptoms, really, really look at anywhere that you could possibly be getting cross-contamination. Would you say that's a good idea? Yeah, absolutely. And what about those who present with neurological symptoms? Would you expect their sy symptoms to improve in the same way? So the neurological symptoms are slightly different in the fact that the longer the neurological symptoms go and treated for, the more likely there'll be no or limited improvement in those symptoms. And that can be quite problematic because it's been shown that those patients who present with neurological symptoms, it can actually take 10 years longer for them to get an accurate diagnosis compared to those who present with the traditional gut related symptoms. Yeah. So there's that possibility that people with neurological symptoms are going a lot longer. They're still eating gluten. gluten, they're still eating gluten for a lot longer, not yeah. realising that gluten is causing the neurological symptoms. Because there are, there's quite a big cohort of people who have no gut symptoms but just have the neurological symptoms. Aren't yeah. they? So, okay, so it just takes longer to get to them, by which point the damage is done. Absolutely. But for so general people who are coming along, you've got headaches and, and minor, you know, numbs and tingling. Yeah. We're not saying that that will never clear up. No, absolutely. We're saying that the very, very strict gluten free diet should hopefully improve those. But it's just being aware that if there is actually damage to the, full, the nervous system, yeah. that might be quite difficult to reverse with the gluten free diet. But the average celiac, that's not relevant. No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's remembering, you know, with the neurological symptoms, a very, very strict mm -hmm. gluten free diet is essential to prevent any further deterioration of symptoms. So, for example, I had a patient in clinic who just had the neurological symptoms and that was it. And they try the gluten free diet and some of those symptoms didn't completely disappear. And their question was, well, why am I continuing on the gluten free diet? And the answer to that was that they need to stop any further deterioration. So it may not have completely resolved what they had in the past, but it's going to be being really, really strict with the gluten free diet is hopefully going to prevent them getting worse. So people who've got sort of balance issues, dizziness, who are falling over, can't get their, their feet to move in a straight line, that's yeah. sort of taxi type problems. It's even more important for them to be super strict so that they get as much improvement as they can out of taking the gluten out, but also don't deteriorate further. Absolutely. Okay. So what we want you to do now is kind of take this moment to think about your symptoms and think about whether they have improved since you started the gluten free diet. Are there any other symptoms which are kind of still affecting your sort of quality of life and your day to day living? And if you are still experiencing symptoms, we would suggest you see your GP who may consider a blood test. And also you may want to consider completing the self referral form for an appointment with our specialist community dietitian. Okay. Also, it's important that you see your GP if, despite following a strict gluten-free diet, you develop any new gut symptoms, if you have any unexplained weight loss, um, if you have any blood in your stools, or if you regularly wake at night to open your bowels. So if you have any of those gut symptoms, we would recommend going to see your GP. So what to do if you're still having gut symptoms? What else should you do? We really want you to look at your diet in detail and check whether you're following a strict gluten-free diet. And it might be helpful to refer to our newly diagnosed celiac webinar available on our website. You then might want to look at some useful handouts. So we've got one attached attached to this webinar um, and it's developed by Celiac UK. It's a guide to common plants, seeds, grains, cereals and flowers. And you know there are lots of new grains appearing in our shops and supermarkets at the moment, many of which are gluten free. However, there are also quite a few which aren't suitable for the gluten free diet. So this guide is quite helpful to, to show you which ones are OK and which ones are not suitable. The next handout we've got, which is attached to this webinar, is a, a basic sort of generic guide to different ingredients. And again, this is produced by Celiac UK, uh, also available on their website. It tells you which foods to look out for, uh, which foods are likely gluten free and which that aren't and those that you need to check. But as it's quite generic, we'd still say check the individual ingredients to check if they're suitable. So how do I know if a food is gluten free? Well, 
it should be labelled as gluten free, um, hopefully quite clearly. Uh, it sh it, if it has the cross grain symbol, so this is a nationally and internationally recognised as a symbol which indicates that a product is suitable for a gluten free diet and it's promoted by celiac organisations worldwide. And also it's important to look at the ingredients, so any um, allergens should be highlighted in bold in the ingredients list and you can see with this one here so you can see durum wheat is highlighted in bold which indicates that this product is not suitable for a gluten-free diet and the following ingredients so you've got wheat rye barley oats spelt and khorasan wheat and these are not suitable for a gluten-free diet. The exception would be the oats if they are labelled as gluten-free. And then you've got, so if you have any queries at all, you've always got the Celiac UK um, hotline, uh, which is the number on this screen, uh, 0333322033. And you can always call them if you have any queries. You've then got the food and drink guide, which is produced by Celiac UK, and you can access this as a booklet. You can also access it online as a member and you can access the app which they produce. But it's really important to, to keep up to date with these um, and you can check the website monthly um, for Celi on the Celiac UK website. Do they put there? I see you've got a little icon there at the bottom. Is that an example of a page of where they're telling you that products are changing? Yes. So you need to. So a product might be gluten free one month and yeah, producers exactly. might have changed the ingredients. So yeah. you need to keep up to date. OK, that's useful. So you go and see that UK and they've got that product change list. Yeah. Yeah. You can download each month's update. So there's a, like a um, handout for each month which you can use to update it so yeah we would recommend doing it monthly yeah and it's important if you have the app as well just to check that it does update regularly so some phones will do it automatically or you can do it manually okay so you could actually go into your phone settings to make sure it's updating yeah the app. and it will auto don't just assume that it's auto updating yeah. okay that's yeah. good to know so on this slide you can see a, um, a number of foods which were once gluten-free and no longer are. And it's really important to, to, this is why it's important to check for the updates because manufacturers do change their ingredients from time to time. And, and um, a food which you may have used quite regularly, which was gluten-free may no longer be. And notice there, Leslie, actually one of the supermarket own brand products has come off. That's right. So the one in the bottom left corner there is is no longer certified as gluten free in the Celiac UK directory. And um, when we looked at Celiac UK's website, this is because this uh, particular producer hasn't submitted the information needed to certify whether it's gluten free or not. Okay. Therefore, so you're saying it might still actually be gluten free, but you can't trust it because yeah they I wouldn't take that they risk okay yeah, you wouldn't because they risk. haven't submitted that information so okay. Celiac UK cannot confirm whether confirm. it's safe to okay. eat or not so I think this just highlights the importance of maybe using this opportunity to do almost like an MOT of all the foods mm, that you eat yeah. to double check things so mm. I have patients who come along and say oh I've been having the same cornflakes for years yeah. and kind of automatically assume mm. that each month they buy it it's fine mm. so it's worth just double checking those kind of taking this opportunity to check everything in your cupboards and make sure you're still picking those foods which are certified yeah as gluten free yeah, that's a good idea so Leslie mentioned a couple of the apps which are available. So if you are a member of CLEC UK, which we would recommend, um, you have access to a couple of apps. So first up, you've got Gluten Free on the Move. Now, this is where you can find the food and drink directory booklet in an app format. It also has some other sections, so including a venue guide, which you can log on to and find out which restaurants in your local area are certified by CLEC UK. It's also got the option of having the barcode scan, which you can use to scan a barcode and find out whether it's, whether it's in the directory. You've also got a gluten-free food check, which is one of the more recent apps. And again, it gives you the option of scanning foods to see whether it's gluten-free. An a useful um, part of this app is the fact that you can add additional dietary requirements to it. So, for example, if you're following a gluten-free diet but also follow a dairy-free diet for other reasons, you can add that filter to it and then you can scan a food and you'll be able to tell whether it's gluten-free as well as dairy-free. So that's just an additional benefit of that app. Mm. 
That's made by Food Maestro, is it? That or one's made by Food Maestro. It's called Gluten Free Food, food Checker. Checker. Absolutely. Okay. But they're both ones that you can access with your Celiac UK membership. Okay. Um, so, how often should you update your food and drink directory? So, we're just going to ask a question, a bit of a who wants to be millionaire type question. How often do you think you should update your food and drink directory based on what we've uh, we've said just now, the, the booklet? Would you update it every month, every six months, once a year, or never? If you want to have a quick think about that. Okay, so what's the answer? Every month. So every month we would recommend, as we said, because those products are often changed, companies often change their ingredients, so it's really sensible to make sure that every month you update your list and just check your foods. But if you're, as Leslie very kindly suggested, making sure that your app on your phone automatically updates, then you should automatically get those updates. But every month, yeah. Okay, so moving on to cross-contamination. So we now know that even the smallest amount of gluten can cause some damage to the line of the gut. So it's really important that we look at cross-contamination, which is when gluten accidentally gets into a food during processing, cooking, or serving. So here's a picture of some common sources of cross-contamination. So you've got breadcrumbs you might get from a toaster. Um, if you're preparing a gluten-free meal on the same work surface, where there's kind of breadcrumbs from other foods, cooking utensils and pots and pans, if they have normal gluten-containing foods in there, then you put your gluten-free food and there's some source of cross-contamination. A really a common one is your butter and jam condiments. So if you've got someone who spreads a bit of butter on their toast and then pops the knife back in to get some more, there's going to be breadcrumbs there. Frying pans, fryers, which you might find in fish and chip shops, and you know, grill pans as well may also be a source of cross-contamination. Why, why are chips a problem? So it's more to do with what else might be in the oil which is cooked those chips. So, for example, if you go to a fish and chip shop and they've used their cooking their chips in the same oil which they cook their battered fish in, the batter from that, which contains wheat and contains therefore contains gluten, may cross contaminate with those chips. So your chips are basically being dunked in oil that has already got molecules of gluten in it from the yeah. batter they've cooked. Okay. Absolutely. What about when you're eating out? I'm just thinking of an example. Recently I went for coffee and cake with a friend and I noticed that the gluten free cake was side by side with the gluten containing cake and there were lots of crumbs everywhere would this have been an issue if I had celiac disease yeah absolutely because there was that risk of sort of a small crumb of gluten containing cake may have got on the gluten free cake and I think that's a really good example of how it can be difficult for people who have celiac disease to go out and eat sometimes because of that lack of awareness yeah I think lots of places now know they need to increase the the options for gluten free but whether they're aware of the sort of the issues with the cross contamination, how careful they need to be with the serving and the preparation. Yeah, mm. that's a real concern. I think it drives a lot of people now on gluten free diets, aren't they, who aren't celiac? Yeah. And for them, of course, cross contamination isn't necessarily yeah. relevant. Uh, and so I've seen quite often, like you in, in, a, in a cafe, where they've got the gluten free cakes next to the normal yeah. cakes, and there's no separation at all, really. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's being aware of cross contamination, not only at home, but equally when you are going out and about. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the things we recommend in terms of trying to prevent cross contamination is using separate toasters to cook to toast your gluten free bread or even use the toaster bags. Making sure you clean your pots and pans and normal sort of hot soapy water will be enough to remove the gluten. If you, you know, if you're frying foods, making sure you use a clean oil or a separate fryer to fry off your gluten free foods. Using different butter knives and jam spoons or even separate butter and jam pots specifically for people who are going to be using it on their gluten free foods, making sure you wipe down the surfaces before you prepare your gluten-free foods, and also kind of using separate chopping boards for those. Okay, let's go for another question, get your mind thinking. So, you go to a pub for a meal, what should you do before ordering your food? So, A, should you do nothing? B, should you tell the staff you have celiac disease? C, should you discuss cross-contamination with somebody? D, should you ask for the gluten-free options from their menu? What do you think you should do before ordering? Okay, what are the answers, Leah? So first up, you want to make sure you tell the staff that you have celiac disease. So I often see patients who say they just ask for the gluten-free menu, but I think it's really important that staff are aware that you have celiac disease and therefore highlight the fact that even the smallest amount of gluten could, could cause you some damage to the gut. Do people, do people get quite uncomfortable, don't they? They don't want to make a fuss. They don't want to be seen to be making a fuss. So uh, what, what do you say to somebody who's like, oh, I really don't want people to know I've got celiac disease, I just want to quietly get on with my meal and have the gluten-free options? Yeah, 
well, there is a tool which we're going to talk about in a moment, so we will come on to that. But some people will email ahead, contact the place that they're meeting ahead of time and say, look, I'm coming in, I have sciatic disease, I will be asking for the gluten-free menu, but can you also be aware of the issues of cross-contamination? Because that is something you would need to discuss as well, making sure you discuss cross-contamination with the staff and making sure that whoever's doing the preparation in the kitchen is aware of those measures that need to be taken. So when you say staff, because I found that waiting staff often haven't really got full knowledge, so they'll run to the kitchen, ask, and then come out and tell you. And I've had a salad presented to me where they just pulled the croutons off the salad. Yeah. And so obviously the salad's not suitable now, but they've said, oh, no, it's gluten-free now. So would you recommend always talking to the chef? Yeah. Whoever's doing the preparation of the meal, so whether it was, the, you know, in the chef and also anyone who comes into almost, if they're preparing, you know, sometimes you find that the chef does the main meal, but it might be the waiting staff add some sauces to it, et cetera. So both the waiting staff and the chef would need to be aware of that. And one tool that we have produced, which you may find helpful, is this sort of restaurant business card size um, tool, which you could use. So it's one of the handouts. So it's basically a page of A4, which you can print off back double sided, and it will produce sort of eight mini business cards, which talks about the fact that you have celiac disease and some tips for preventing um, cross contamination. So it's something that you could carry around in your handbag or in, in your phone case. And if you are going to a restaurant and you don't want to be seen as you know, kicking up a fuss and talking openly about your celiac disease and the gluten um, need for the strict gluten free diet, it's something you could hand over to staff to kind of give them a little bit more information. Okay, so you don't need to sort of send you to say, well, look, um, can I give you this? I'm celiac. Do you want to have a quick read of that? Yeah, that's really useful. So people just print that page off and then they can just cut. You've got what, yeah. four business cards per page. That's it. So oh, about eight. A bit of okay. card size. It's like size. A card. Okay, little size. So they could just print that sheet off at home and then cut those out and they can take one every time they go out and just give it to the restaurant yep. staff. OK, that's brilliant. It's just a way to try and increase awareness. And I think that was that's the key thing. Celiac UK mm. do a great job in mm. terms of that. But anything that we can do to get to some of those cafes, restaurants, mm. pubs, which maybe aren't aware of the need to consider cross-contamination for their patients with celiac their people with celiac disease is really important it does include on the business card where they can go to for further information via celiac uk excellent that's a really good tool for people because it is sometimes a bit embarrassing to have to say it too much and you could give that as soon as you come in everybody knows what's going on then it also differentiates you really nicely from the people who are on a gluten-free diet for health reasons absolutely like that. not that i would like to stress that gluten-free diet is good for health um, at all in the sense that you shouldn't do it just to lose weight or do a gluten-free diet for um, just because it becomes a fad um, but it differentiates you immediately from those people that are saying that you become very ill when yeah. you consume the tiniest amounts and I think that you know people then sit up and listen don't they yeah so you've gone through your checklist you are sure that you're following a really really strict gluten-free diet but you still have some gut symptoms it might therefore raise the question is is, are these symptoms associated with irritable bowel syndrome, so also known as IBS? Well, I think it's a really good uh, point because there's absolutely no reason to see it why you can't also suffer from IBS. And, um, and if we look at the stats, in fact, about 38% of people with celiac disease will have IBS type symptoms. And of course, they can feel very similar. Um, and get very mixed up. There's a huge overlap between the two conditions between IBS and celiac disease. With IBS, you can you can get diarrhea, you can get grumbling stomach, you can get abdominal pain, you can get wind, you can get bloating, just as you can with celiac disease. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure my celiac disease is clearing up on the gluten-free diet, it could be as simple as the fact that you're suffering from IBS. So just to kind mm. of highlight there, so IBS symptoms are almost when someone with celiac disease mm. who's followed a strict gluten-free diet and they're, they've been confirmed that their gut is completely healed. Yep. So when the gut is healed, mm. but they're still getting gut-related symptoms, that's yep. kind of where it comes under the kind of the bracket of IBS. Yeah. yeah. So if they've gone and had their bloods retested and their TTG levels are back to zero, then uh, and they're still getting symptoms, then this would be the first port of call would be to look at your IBS and whether you've got IBS. And we've got a great first line IBS advice webinar as well. So again, if you just email us on the patient.webinars at nhs.net, that's the email we use for everything, and we will send you the registration link to that webinar. And you can make some really simple changes uh, for IBS symptoms. You can make lifestyle changes, things like, you know, making sure that you don't uh, have mobile phones at the, the dinner table, that you sit down and relax, that you eat slowly and don't rush on the run, etc. But then there are other things like making sure you limit your spicy food, 
uh, that you don't have foods that are too high in fat, that you don't have too much caffeine because the, ca the caffeine in coffee uh, can overstimulate the bowel and cause a bit of abdominal pain. Um, alcohol, making sure you're not drinking too much alcohol, you're keeping within the limits. And then, of course, you've got the FODMAP diet, which is now uh, very well recognized as a good treatment for, um, for irritable bowel syndrome. We do have a webinar on the low FODMAP diet. So if you watch the webinar on, on IBS, it will automatically send you a link or you can just email us again at the patient.webinars at nhs.net and we'll send you the link for the low FODMAP diet webinar. So why is a gluten-free diet so important? We just want to emphasize the fact that it is a lifelong gluten-free diet. So sometimes I get asked the question, after I start a gluten-free diet, once I start to feel better, can I reintroduce gluten? So have a little think about that and what would your answer be? So as I mentioned, the answer is no, because it is a lifelong strict gluten-free diet because it's not a condition that you will grow out of. So the benefits of a lifelong gluten-free diet include the fact that if you sustain yourself on a gluten-free diet, it's going to lead to the healing of the gut, which therefore can lead to improved nutrient absorption and reduce the risk of associated complications, including some of those neurological symptoms that we mentioned. Um, hopefully, you'll lead to some improvement in energy levels, improvement in sort of general health and well-being, and a general improvement in the overall quality of life. So where do you go next for further guidance and support? Well, there are a number of resources that you can turn to. So you've got the Celiac UK website and wherever you live, you can find out about local groups in your area. So here we have one for, for Somerset. You've also got the local Somerset group email. And if you contact them, you can ask to be added to their distribution, distribution list for their newsletter. And they've also got a uh, Somerset Celiac group, um, which is a closed uh, Facebook group, which you can request to join. If you contact Celiac UK, they'll give you a list of all the groups in the country, won't they? So if you're listening to this webinar and you're living in Dundee or yeah. Newcastle or somewhere completely different, if you contact Celiac UK, they have a very good list of all the groups they throughout do. the yeah. UK. So, yeah. And it's also on Celiac UK's website. Yeah, yeah perfect. You've then got our, um, our own website, so www.patientwebinars.co.uk, and this is where we have all our webinar information from our self-referral form, and you can also sub -quest um, submit questions via this website. We've also got a Twitter account that you can follow or, or ask a question to, and that's at patientwebinars. And we've also got our NHS email account. So if you have a question um, after today's session, then you can submit to, that to us using the email patient.webinars at nhs.net. On the website, can you download the handouts from the website as well? Yes, yeah, so we will make sure that we put all the handouts from today's webinar onto our website. And all the webinars, we have all the handouts for all the different webinars on there? Yes. OK, that's good. And I would just highlight it's worth keeping an eye on the patient webinars website as well as the Twitter account, because that's where we'll advertise any new webinars mm. that we're developing. Um, and if you want to be added to a distribution list for kind of to be told, emailed when we develop a new webinar, you can also email us at that address. So in summary, what should I do now? So as discussed, we'd recommend you use this opportunity to, to measure your height, height and weight and just think about whether there's been any unintentional weight loss or not. Think about your symptoms. Are some of those symptoms still present? And if they are, you may want to consider seeing your GP. You can complete the self-referral form, which is which you can download, and that will give you the, the opportunity of having a one-to-one -one appointment with one of our specialist dietitians. In the meantime, you can go through that checklist to make sure your diet is strictly gluten-free, and you could also consider some of those IBS dietary changes that we mentioned. We'd also recommend you complete the self-assessment test, which gives you an indication of how adherent you are to the street gluten-free diet. Check all your food labels and consider those cross-contamination measures, measures. And we'd also recommend completing the self-referral form if you're struggling with the gluten-free diet, if gut symptoms continue despite following a gluten-free diet, 
and also if you scored 18 or more on the self-assessment test. So if you're outside of Somerset, um, you wouldn't be filling a self-referral form, you'd be asking for a referral from your GP to your local dietetics department. Absolutely. And just a final reminder that you, we would recommend you go and see your GP if despite following a strict gluten-free diet, you develop any new gut symptoms, you have any unexplained weight loss, any blood in your stores, and if you reg or if you regularly wake at night to open your bowels. And just a final reminder that you can download the handouts now and they'll also be available on our website. And that's got the test on there as well that you mentioned yes. just now, hasn't it? Yes, that would be part of the referral form, which you can access okay. as well. So if you have a problem today downloading them from watching this, you could just go to the website and download them. From yeah, there. absolutely. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. And we hope you've enjoyed uh, the webinar and that you'll come to our future webinars. Thank you very much.